Okay, so to uh, first start, I would love to know the backstory of how this began, um, how you took interest in this story, and, and literally um, when you first took the project on. Um, so Ryan and I worked together on a project called The Keepers, uh, which is a series that's um, true crime investigative about a murder in Baltimore. Um, and it came out in 2017, which is the same year that Kim Jong-nam was murdered. Uh, we got a phone call from a journalist named Doug Bach Clark, who said, I've got this story that I'm working on. It's um, investigative. It's really fascinating about the murder of Kim Jong-nam. And both Ryan and I said, oh, we remember that headline, uh, which was pretty much what we found a lot of people remember. It's just that it had happened, and we didn't really know any more than that. And he said, uh, there's a lot more to that, more, a lot more to the story. And I thought you guys might be interested. I think it could make a really good documentary. Um, if you want to learn more? And we we said, sure, you know, go ahead. And then we're both really blown away once we found out uh, what he had discovered or what he was really revealing to the American community, which had missed a lot of this story, partially because of the timing of the murder, which was February 2017, right after Trump's full month, first full month in office. And I think that Unfortunately, the headlines were taken up with that to a large extent and people just missed it, including us, until Doug brought it to our attention. And we were grateful that he had found and doggedly followed the story. He you know, had already traveled to, to meet the Indonesian woman and start to find out what she had to say about what had happened to her. <clears throat> um, I was really struck by uh, the beginning, how the film began, which really, um, makes the use of camera and, and um, how everything was recorded in a way, right? The viewer and the uh, viewed and CCTV and, and, um, and social media, obviously posting on Facebook. Um, so this use is, is constant throughout the film. So that was obviously uh, very much a big part of the story. Um, do you want to tell us how um, visually that you were using that as a metaphor? Yeah, I think often cell phone footage and especially CCTV footage are seen as ugly, objectively. Um, and I don't think as a documentary filmmaker that's necessarily true. And I think both of those formats allow the viewer um, a kind of intimacy when it comes to cell phone footage and a surveillance you feel when it comes to CCTV, which were two huge themes of this film. So we decided to lean into that in a way that we haven't in our previous films. So, so much of the film becomes about the, this era of social media. And I think that's universal. That's, that's, that's far broader than just you know, this one woman in Vietnam and this one woman in Indonesia, this is young people worldwide. And um, using social media or finding opportunities on social media that can make you more money or that can um, take you out of the, the hard circumstances that you're in or lead to a better life. And so the fact that both women had documented their own lives um, so fully on social media we leaned into that into the film because we also knew we were most likely going to never meet them. Like from the moment we began this film, everyone was telling us they were going to be executed for the murder. And so we thought, well, if we don't ever get to meet our main subjects, we have to bring them to life through their, their, own, their own filming. And then as far as the CCTV goes, I think we are so lucky that the lawyers were willing to work with us because almost none of that CCTV was, was available to the public. You know, immediately after the murder, there were a few shots that leaked out, you know, of Dwan and the LOL shirt, which went viral. Uh, but no one had access to how the full day went down. And so um, when we got access to both of their defense teams, they showed us all of the footage because it, it proved what they were saying, that these women might actually be innocent. If you watch the play-by-play, of the seven or eight hours of how this all goes down in the airport from the moment, you know, Duan arrives in the morning to the moment the North Koreans leave on their airplanes to fly back to North Korea, 
when you start tracing all of those moments, it's almost like a, it was almost like a video game in some ways. Like we had a team of editors watching it and it's almost like watching video game footage to figure out where all of the, you know, protagonists are, where all of the antagonists are, seeing when they're meeting with one, one another. So that took months for us to kind of trace the web of what went down in the airport that day. Uh, which I thought was visually so interesting because actually there are drawings and there are computer generated images and obviously we have audio. So you are using um, also text message reconstruction. So I think all of those things somehow um, makes this uh, in many ways what seems to be almost a theater, right? Because it's, it's a prank that was used in order to um, murder someone and, and also solve a political problem. So visually, um, it must have been daunting to bring all those materials together to fit the puzzle of this. Yeah, I mean, at some point we had been encouraged, maybe you guys wanna make this a series. And at some point we were like, how are we going to fit it all in a feature? Because we were, as Ryan said, we were so lucky to have access to this material that people hadn't seen and that didn't end up being revealed in the trial. So we recognized how important all of it was and that we wanted to include as much of it as possible. I mean, just the CCTV alone, we had to trim so much out of that that we all found fascinating. You know, in that video game world that Ryan was describing, we were finding moments. And an example of that is we showed just very briefly how the, the North Korean operatives were dressed a certain way. And then um, we'd show how later in the footage, you see them dressed differently. There's footage of that, you know, there's footage of them coming into the bathroom with a backpack and a hat on and then coming out with something different on having shaved their beards and completely changed and all of that we would have loved to spend more time on that. Um, but we just weren't able to because there was so much that we wanted to include. The text messages being a great example too. I mean, that really shows the understanding that the women had about what they were doing. And so those were very important for us to be sure we included. And how did you, um, and I, I was struck by, um, I guess there's a constant theme of vulnerability, right? Because as you just said, it's almost like they're characters in a video game, but their lives are at stake. And how vulnerable that information is that they were putting on their um, social media all the time. Some of which ended up being evidence to prove their innocence, but also it's also what got them in trouble to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's vulnerability and, and naivete that's a huge uh, theme of the film because, you know, both women, now that, now that I do know them, um, you know, they were both seeking a better life. They were both from very different parts, you know, diff very different circumstances, but they were both kind of seeking um, the same thing and both were kind of willing to do anything um, to get out of the, the circumstances that they were currently in. So the vulnerability, you know, like from the very beginning when we began the film, we wanted to focus on the women. The, and that was the mystery of who these women were, but we weren't interested in focusing at the beginning of making the film. We weren't interested in focusing on the larger geopolitical web that surrounded them. Like our, our guiding star all along was who are they? And let's find that out. And the more we dug and the more we found text messages or social media profiles, the more our eyes were be op being open to the fact that they might not be professional assassins, that they might have actually been tricked, and then they might just be vulnerable women that could be from anywhere in the world. Um, you know, and now that I know them, that's who they are. You know, I know them personally, and when I'm with them, it reminds me of any of my friends from all over the world when I hang out with them. And so it's very humanizing in a way, you know, because they looked so scary at the beginning, especially Dewan with the LOL sweatshirt. And then three years later, when I finally met them to be in their hometowns or in cars with them, and then to get a real taste of a, of a personality of a young woman that I, you know, get along with and I'm joking with. Um, I hope if our film does anything, it humanizes both of them, you know, and is proof that the headlines at the beginning can be very misleading 
um, and very conclusive in a way that's that's too conclusive, that's dangerous. Um, so in, I guess that's the arc of the film, right? Like what were you uh, planning with uh, um, the tension throughout the film? Um, because the way were you as filmmakers, uh, the women's innocence really, I, I think, I guess my question is that, was it really, um, did you walk in there with any assumption of the women's guilt or innocence? Mm -hmm. um, and it was the arc really finding out that in fact they might just be pawn or they might just have actually nothing to do with any of this. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the assumptions that you yourselves as filmmaker, because ultimately it's a mystery, right? This movie. Yeah. I mean, I think for both of us, having initially read the headline, assumed the women were hired assassins. And I guess in a way they were. Um, but, and so we went into it initially thinking that. Doug told us there was more to the story. But even once you learn that the kernel of what they're claiming, it sounds unbelievable to be honest how could someone think that they were on a prank show and kill somebody like that just you say that sentence and everyone's like that's no way so i think and i think that that's sort of the the beauty of the orchestration of it is it's so ridiculous it's such a spectacle that it seems like it's not believable and then once you get into the evidence and once you get into the material that we were provided and that we were able to see you realize that it's actually the most likely scenario yeah, that this is what happened and you start to realize uh, the path that they were taken down. And also, this is how it works with everyone. You start to recognize them as people, you know, because initially they were just a name to us. And as we started to recognize and get to know their families and all of that, you start to understand more about who they are and what brought them to that day. So I think that you're right that I, speaking for me and I think for you too, both of us were learning so much as we went along as we were able to see who they were and what had happened to them. And you have to make, uh, and I think this is also what you're getting at, you have to make those editorial decisions. Like early on in the film, do you reveal that they might be innocent or do you wait for that reveal? Uh, and that was, I would think the biggest challenge in editing this film is like, how do we do that slow reveal? Because as storytellers, we, we almost had the benefit of the fact that so few, at least Americans, so few Americans knew about this story. They knew the headline and everyone, when I tell them about what I was working on or my finished film, they say, oh, was that the women in the airport or something? But no one knows much more than that. So it's rare that you can be making a documentary about such a huge story, right? This is probably the biggest political assassination of our lifetimes, but that, people don't know the details. People don't actually know whether they're guilty or innocent. And people, and especially Americans, don't know what happened to the women. They don't know if they were executed. They don't know if they were acquitted. And so we wanted to take the audience on that journey of figuring that out, um, just as we did. Uh, and so we, it was like, it's almost like Easter eggs. Like, how do you slowly parse out the idea that, you know, because at the beginning, the first 20 minutes of the film, I'd say they look guilty. Um, and we tried to present that, how the world experienced it and how we experienced it. But then how do you slowly open the audience's eyes just as our eyes were being opened while making it to reveal that, 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 that the truth is something else? Because the challenge must be also, I mean, the cities, um, you know, the voice comes and then actually the person comes, right? That is revealed sort of gradually to the audience. And um, what we're really getting is the lawyer's office, the legal team, who are the source for, for this film. So what were some of the challenges? Because it's really hard to present a story um, visually, right? With um, just legal team going through papers. <laughs> We, and we've done it before, and we always say we're never going to make another film about a lawsuit or a trial, and then we're, I think we're doing two more coming mm -hmm. up. So, uh, yeah, lawyers, lawyers by their very nature, the nature of their work, their work is boring to watch visually, right? It's not, it's reading, and it's having phone calls. So, uh, you know, how do you, how do you make that exciting, I think, is finding the characters within those lawyers. And we were very lucky in that both of their head lawyers were 
were dynamic characters um, and very different from one another. You know, one was very cavalier, um, very open to taking huge risks, you know, was shouting from the rooftops from the beginning that North Korea was involved in this. And the other one was a much more old school, sophisticated, quiet, cerebral attorney. So we had like a nice, we had a nice um, dichotomy there. And then Selvi, who is the, the female lawyer for City, who works for Mr. Gooey, uh, once we met her and we realized that she was the, she was the connector to Siti. She was the one going into jail all the time and meeting with Siti and Siti and her were becoming very close. To have a female lawyer who had become so close with one of the female defendants was huge because she's one of my favorite voices in the entire film. You know, so smart, such a brilliant lawyer, but also such an empathetic woman that I think without her voice, it would have been a lot harder to humanize both of the women because she became friends with Dewan as well, just by like her very big heart and empathetic nature of spending so much time talking to them in prison. I thought it was um, interesting how um, the story of the two women, which obviously is the focus of the film, um, and then there's also the reporters, right? And that you decided to employ for the narration because they're the ones who actually explain what's going on. And, um, and I wonder about this and what the director's uh, decision was because both of those uh, reporters are really uh, American voice, right? Because there's Washington Post and there's Bernard News, which is uh, uh, affiliated with the US funded Mm -hmm. Radio Free Asia. So using, I guess the public might not be as aware watching the film that these reporters' voices are particularly American, mm -hmm. but how would you, um, because the story actually is politically um, driven mm -hmm. um, in the center, I, I, it's, it's just a question that I, I wondered and mm -hmm. I thought probably would be asked at some point. Yeah, it's a great question. I will say that there were, we, we always knew we wanted to find a reporter character. I'm speaking to Hadi specifically, the Malaysian journalist, more so than Anna, who's not speaking about the trial in the film. She's more speaking big picture. Uh, but we always knew we wanted to find a local journalist or a journalist that was on the ground there to be the narrator, like you said. And we approached many journalists who were not allowed to participate in the film. Like, I won't, I won't say who they are, what publications they work for, and they weren't all from Malaysia. There were other, there were other Asian countries that we were there. Because, you know, when we're on the ground at the trial, we're always trying to get a sense of character, since I'm not in my own film. So every reporter that I was watching or talking to, I was trying to get a sense of who might be interesting on camera to help explain this. And there were multiple people, and this isn't to say Hadi was our last choice because he was talking to us as well, but there were multiple reporters that we made inroads with, some of whom even wanted to participate, but then when we talked to their parent companies would say no, um, for various reasons. I think part of that is fear, part of that is Malaysian journalists are, don't have total freedom of the press, and so their parent companies were a little nervous about it. Um, you know, part of that, some of the companies were Japanese and weren't sure how this would segue into an American documentary. So we were very lucky to find Hadi, who's, who doesn't just work for Benar News. He's a, he's a freelancer. So he writes for Malaysian publications as well. He writes for American publications, British ones, who was this sort of like island that could get around. Um, you know, he didn't have a parent company that was worried about it. And he's very brave. Like from the very beginning, he said like, oh, I'll go to the airport with you and show you around. And when you're filming in a foreign country, when you don't necessarily have permission to be filming, you need someone who's willing to kind of break the rules a little bit and, and bear that risk with you. And that, that's Hadi's personality. So then we ended up kind of, you know, coupling up with him throughout the trial to use him as a narrator. So that probably relates to this other question, which I think is probably, it could probably be a question that's probably been brought up, but because it, it is centering around um, 
the most important uh, political, geopolitical uh, uh, event, um, at least in the Korean sense, um, if not actually the world, because it, it does involve nuclear North Korea and their succession, which is at the bottom of this murder. But there's not a single Korean interviewed in the film. And I think um, I wonder about that throughout watching the film, if that was actually, because clearly it's very clear that focus is on the women mm -hmm. and their narrative, um, really power in the film. But this absence of a Korean voice in the film made me wonder if that was actually something that you intended or if it was like you said, try to get someone to really participate and they actually wouldn't. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, I was speaking specifically of North Koreans, because of course we would have loved to interview the North Koreans that were involved, and we tried to find all of them, including James, who's missing, and could not. But we found other North Koreans, like for instance, when we went to um, Vietnam to investigate Duan's story, like at the bar where she was uh, recruited, uh, and she was recruited there by Mr. Y, so a, a North Korean, there were North Koreans in that bar that we were talking to because they're regulars there. And definitely none of them felt comfortable. Right when they knew we were making a film, they said they were willing to talk to us and talk about the story and how they'd heard of it. Uh, but the moment we said we were a film crew and making a documentary, there was a very big fear there that they could not be documented in any way. Um, and we ran into that quite a bit, mostly in Vietnam, which has an open relationship with North Korea, but in Malaysia as well, you know, like at the embassy, those types of things where we would talk to people, but they would only be willing to talk off of the record because of the fear of the regime. And I think that's, it does actually probably relate the fear, but also the, um, I guess it does, it does constantly bring, the film does constantly bring the powerlessness of an individual against this um, very bizarre, but very, very big and very dangerous circumstances. And the fact that both of them, Siti and Duan, are foreigners, right? Mm -hmm. Stuck in the Malaysian legal uh, nightmare. Mm -hmm. So um, where the film was moving to, which actually becomes quite more beautiful as we get to know the women, because we see them in their environment. Um, how did you, uh, I mean, I'm not going to spoil the ending. <laughs> Although I guess we've all seen the film at this yeah, point. Yeah, I think they've seen it. Go spoil it, Suki. Yeah. But the ending of their, um, because the women who are constantly being referred to as girls, and they do feel like girls in many points, but they particularly look quite vulnerable um, at the end. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what your director's vision was for the end. It's so, it's so interesting because I have to put myself back in my shoes before I met them. And I met them on different trips. I met, I met Siti at one point and Duan on another. And so it was Siti first. And my version that I had, I get, guess, created in my own head of Siti, because her circumstances had been so much harder in life of education and poverty and working in sweatshops and sex work. I just had this vision of her of being so much um, quieter and more reserved. And then Duan, because you know she had been on prank shows or Vietnamese Idol, I had this vision of someone who was going to be a big extrovert and love the attention of a documentary filmmaker coming in. And both of them were the opposites of what I was expecting, which made it very interesting to meet them and try to film with them. Like, from the moment we met Siti, she was a bundle of energy, so funny, so full of life, loved the idea of being on camera and embraced it totally. Whereas Duan, when I met her in Vietnam, I found it very sad, like, cause I don't know what she was like before this. Um, so I don't know if this is just my version of what she was or what she was actually like. But when I met her in Vietnam, I met somebody who was so afraid and so fearful of people knowing who she was, but also not wanting attention or fame in any way. So she was actually much harder to get to participate in the documentary in the end because she was, 
she'd had her spirit broken by this experience in a way that for whatever reason, I don't think Siti did. Maybe because Siti never pursued that career to be famous for that for years like Dewan did. Um, and so it is, I, it is a beautiful ending in a way, but I also think it's such a sad ending. And like my hope, I met them right after they returned from prison. So they were still obviously very traumatized from the experience. My hope is that over the months and years since that they will, I know they can never fully recover or become who they were before this experience, but my hope is that both of them get closer to who the original Siti and who the original Duan were. Because I mean, clearly, I think the ending, which is, there is the, such a haunting loneliness in, in the ending of these women back home, but somehow it feels like an isolation in an odd sense. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they've now gone through a, a very traumatic prison sentence. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that um, which I thought was really uh, uh, powerful to bring, I mean, also a man's death, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the center of it all. So the sort of void that all of that has, um, which kept running throughout, and, and which I guess brings the point that what was the, um, I guess I was looking for that through watching the film, the sort of one visual sense that's running that theme throughout. I mean, if it's a sense of surveillance or um, what would you say that that, um, I'm not sure what the film language it would be for that. <laughs> Some right. sort of visual cue that um, in a way that kept you going through making of this film. Yeah, I mean, I think especially if you're looking at the last 10 minutes of our film, it's very hard to wrap up two very personal stories and then also wrap up a massive geopolitical web that you know is going to unfold long after you've stopped cutting your film. You know, even at the beginning of this year when uh, there was a speculation around Kim Jong-un's health and whether he may have died, which as we all know, as Americans, was like one of the very few stories that cut through at the beginning of coronavirus, was one of the very few things that was on the news besides coronavirus, you know, in those early months. We were struggling because we were saying, oh my gosh, if he, if, if this is true, if any of the speculation is true and he passes away or he's incapacitated and somebody else takes over the regime, our film has to be re-edited completely like, because we knew it wasn't coming out till the end of the year, especially in the year of coronavirus, that we were going to be on hold. So thank God for our film. <laughs> uh, maybe not for the world, but thank God for the, our film that, that nothing crazy has happened over the last eight months. And I've had to rewatch that final 10 minutes many times throughout different revelations over the last year to say, like, does this still make sense? Like, for instance, hopefully Donald Trump is not president by the time this film comes out. Um, but he is a part of that final 10 minutes. And so I kind of see that as like the final 10 minutes as like a snapshot into the end of last year when we left Southeast Asia and we exited the story of this geopolitical web and kind of leave the rest for other journalists and writers like yourselves to fill in what happens, you know, after this movie ends. Then, I mean, I think that that's probably the right, I actually have one more question that I was curious about, which is this movie does have all these, um, all these locations are part of the story, right? Because we have Vietnam, we have Indonesia, and KL, um, Malaysia, and also um, Pyongyang, North Korea, and Macau, China, right? These are places that are all part of the story. And how did you, I mean, what was the challenge, or the challenges of, presenting those locations. I mean, they didn't pop up in the film, but the weight of them in the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I was quite familiar with Hanoi already, which I had been to a lot in the past, but the other two cities were completely new to me. And then obviously Pyongyang was off limits to us. So we had to find other ways to, to you know, bring that city to life. But I think, I mean, that's what's so, that's what's so interesting, I think, about what 
if, if one assumes that Kim Jong-un was a part of orchestrating this, of what he orchestrated, this, this completely international train wreck of an assassination that, that weaved in all of these foreign governments, you know, which we see play out at the end of the trial when both countries are trying to save their women's lives. But, you know, I hope that the film shows how different, because I think at the beginning when you saw the women assassinate them, people didn't even know that they, people still don't know that they weren't North Korean or that they weren't Malaysian, you know, or most American audiences don't know that. And so to, 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 to fully understand the women, you have to get a sense of where they came from and tracing their evolutions, you know, or Siti was, had been living in Malaysia for a couple of years. So many people should just assume she was Malaysian because she was living there and spoke the language. And obviously if you grow up in KL, that is a completely different way of growing up than how Siti grew up in her village in Indonesia. Um, so it was incredibly important for us to get a, a taste of those places. And thank God each family was willing to participate because they were afraid too. You know, they knew that their daughters had been, had been in this web with North Koreans and that they weren't safe either. But both families, I think, were desperate for their daughters not to be executed, that they were willing to put their necks out there as well. Um. I think that's it for the questions. Thank you <laughs> yeah. so much. That was a fun conversation. <laughs>